The first step to learning about something is observation. Watching how things move over time and space and looking for patterns to pick up on. I imagine it was this simple act of viewing the way the world grows that gave rise to the notion of a vector, as well as the idea of a field of vectors. And once you start grazing on the blades of that mathematical grass, you begin to forge a path that evolves into the seemingly magical idea of a force field. Understanding force through vector fields. Whether or not you're trying to predict a hurricane, by observing weather patterns. Perhaps you're trying to understand how electric charges move in an electric field. Or maybe you are wondering about what keeps us grounded to Mother Earth. And the answer lies in the concept of a force field, that is, a vector field. So we'll start with the question, what is a vector field? A vector field on a vector space Rn is a mapping from a domain subset of Rn to Rn. And for every point x, in that domain space, a vector f can be assigned to that point, represented by an arrow whose tail sits at that point in space. So imagine a constant vector field given by a constant vector a. At each point, we can assign that vector a. The vector field arrows show the way the force field flows through space. An example of such a field might be the vector field given by 1, 1, or in physics notation, I plus J. All right, let's consider another force field. Let's consider the force field given by G equals Y negative X, which rotates things in the field around in a circular path. The magnitude of this vector field is fixed on a circle of radius A. And we can see that for different A values, we'll have different circles. Since the dot product of this vector is always perpendicular to the radial vector, G is a tangent vector to this field. In other words, it is a field of tangent vectors. Working out some of the tangent vector directions given by this field, and then graphing them, we find at 0, 0, we have the 0 vector. At 1, 0, we have a vector pointing downward. At 1, 0, we have the vector pointing to the right. And at 1, 1, 1, negative 1 is the vector that we get out of that pointing in a diagonal direction. Plotting these vectors along their different level curves, radiuses of different circles, what we're seeing here is we are plotting the rotational field that emerges out of this. G generates a rotating force field, a vector field. Now each of the vectors on this field are a tangent vector to that circle. That circle represents, or each circle represents, a level set curve.
And sometimes a scalar function, lowercase f, is called a scalar field by mapping a set of vectors to a single number, like temperature. All right, so a very important vector field to study is the one of an attractive or repulsive force field, an inverse square vector field. Given by a position vector r in R3, we can define this force field as a constant divided by the magnitude of that position vector cubed in the direction of that radial vector. But if we define a unit vector for the radial vector to be the vector divided by its length, we can redefine this inverse square field using that unit vector as a constant over the squared magnitude of r in the direction of that unit vector, or in other words, we'll call that the unit radial vector, u hat. Since f is parallel to the radial vector r, we see that its constant of proportionality, that is its strength, is inversely proportional to the distance of r. That is the strength of the force varies with the distance from that which generates the force. Time for a few classic examples. Let's consider the force of gravity between two massive bodies, which is an attractive force, minimizing the distance between them, forcing them closer together. The constant is therefore a negative number, a negative sign indicating an inward force. But in the case of two electrically charged particles of the same charge, Coulomb's law has the same inverse square form field but yet here with a positive constant making it a repelling force, driving things away. You see, like charges repel each other. Unlike charges would attract each other. These are two examples of an attractive and a repelling force of the same inverse square form. So now we're going to consider what a gradient field is and what that has to do with the idea of a potential. We say that a force field is a gradient field. If a vector field F can be written as the gradient of a scalar field, and the gradient is given by the del operator, which is that upside down triangle. It's an operator of partial derivatives. And the gradient itself is a vector, and as such points in the direction of the maximum increase of the field. So if we recall our inverse square field, which is a constant multiple of the unit radial vector, explicitly writing out the expression for the vector components, we get f to be the vector cx, cy, cz, all divided by x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the three halves power. And if we consider the scalar function given by negative c over the magnitude of r, we can see that taking its gradient would in fact give us this vector field. So F is a gradient field because it is the field of a gradient of a scalar field. And such points in the direction of maximum increase of that field. The gradient of any C1 scalar valued function F is perpendicular to the level sets of the function f. Thus, if capital F is a gradient field on the vector space Rn, f must be perpendicular to those level sets of the potential function little f of the vector field f containing the point x. If f is such a potential function, then the level sets are considered or called equipotential sets, or in the set of R3, equipotential surfaces of the vector field. In other words, the level curves can be thought of as different elevations of a contour map of a mountain, and each elevation corresponds to a level curve seen on our contour map. So next we will discuss flow lines, a differentiable path over some interval which flows over the terrain of our field such that the velocity vector x prime yields our vector field x prime is equal to f of x. In this way, x is a parametrized curve of t tracing out the path in the field of f. 
So if we consider a rotational vector field given by, let's say, the vector field f is equal to negative y x. As before, this vector is a fixed length on a perspective level set of circles. Thus, if we follow the path along the vectors, we can travel along a circular path parametrized by x of t equals a cosine t a sine of t. And as t travels from 0 to 2 pi, completing a full revolution, we can define the tangent vectors, negative a sine of t and a cosine t, corresponding to this exact field f. We can see that it corresponds exactly to negative y x. Negative a sine t, a cosine t, flows along the path of the circle in a rotational manner. And so we see that the tangent vectors really do define the flow line path, x, that a particle would take by traveling in this field. A particle moving along a flow line of a gradient field will move from lower point to a higher point of the potential function f. However, since many physical phenomena like heat flow will move from a point of high potential to low potential, physicists often write the gra gradient field as f equals negative gradient of g, ensuring that the value will travel from a higher to lower value as it would with potential energy. It is worth mentioning now the concept of integration and its connection to differential forms. Differential forms use the lowercase d operator to give you a sense of how a differential change in a scalar field occurs as being proportional to the differential in the position vector r. In fact, it is the gradient which is a change in the potential at each point that provides this connection to the magnitude of the differential vector, which is another way of saying that we are measuring a differential vector at each point along the path and then integrating those results. In single variable calculus, a small change in x is given proportionally as dx. But for a scalar field, like something like temperature, which we consider a zero form, the differential df, applying, applying this differential operator lowercase d, produces a covector field, a one form, a differential form. And this differential form is part of the integration process. It allows us to find increments along a parametrized curve, which is in this potential field. So consider the Cartesian plane as a scalar field. If we move in the dx direction, the lines x1, x2, x3, and so on, those are our level set curves in the dx direction moving from a negative to positive, so moving in or oriented in a direction pointing in the direction of the gradient field, f. And similarly for y, it moves from bottom to top, negative to positive, and we see y equals 1, 2, 3, etc. being the covector level sets in the y direction. And so as a complete field, the scalar field would move from a negative negative direction to a positive positive direction. And so the covector field of equipotentials and the gradient field defining the flow lines gives us a geometry that applying a vector to a covector field we find is proportional to the steepness of the potential field itself. So this gives us a way of measuring the magnitude of a vector in a vector field. So for vectors, we have to define this thing called the directional derivative, which is essentially applying a covector field to the tangent vector v. And this directional derivative gives us a sense of a differential of a potential scalar function. When we think about doing an integral, the key components to that integral are the path and the covector field used to measure the vectors going through that path. Evaluating an integral counts the number of vector stacks pierced by the path from A to B.
The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that we can compute the definite integral by simply taking the difference in the antiderivative at the endpoints of the path. One can also observe from this function, written it as the derivative of the antiderivative, that emphasizes using the differential of the antiderivative. And carrying this over to vectors, we get the gradient theorem, where we use the gradient of f to replace df dx. Covector fields are differential forms associated to the level set curves of the field, and dr being a covector field is applied here. Now the concept of work is the result of applying a force over a distance. Work done in a gravitational force field, for instance, is the, given by the integral of the gravitational force applied over some parametrized path lambda on some interval a, b. And thus the work done in a gravity well is proportional to the strength of that gravity force field generated by capital M when applied to some small mass m along its path. And so we see that the field is only as strong as the thing measuring it, like an outgoing mass, m. So because of the physical connection to the inverse square force fields, have the things like the conservation of energy, a gradient field might be written as the negative of a scalar potential. And the gravitational field here acts on a small mass by drawing it closer and therefore its strength depends on the distance. But in a negative way, we see that this is an attractive force. So the gravitational force is a negative gradient field. So for the force of gravity, we have an attractive gradient which acts on the mass m, where phi is the gravitational potential and from this point, point of view, we can see that a mass falling into a gravity well will move from a higher potential to a lower potential, corresponding to the potential energy at work. It requires more energy to pull an object closer from a further distance away. So instead of using the vector field integration, we can use a scalar field integration, which means looking at the level sets or covector fields for the path. And the differential df of the field is equal to a proportional constant of the negative differential d phi. So it is easier to visualize things with these covector equipotential fields than it is to actually look at the vector fields themselves. In other words, there's a deep connection between the vector fields and the covector fields. Covector fields actually live in something called the dual space. So from this reduced point of view, measuring the difference between gravitational potentials from the start to finish can be done by simply integrating the differential of that potential field. And the study of differential forms is born out of this uh, topic. In fact, Green's theorem is a theorem that is really closely related to what we've been talking about here, and it is one of the key theorems in Calculus 3, or Vector Calculus. Anyway, I hope you liked this video. Please hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell for more videos, and may the force be with you.